Paper Mill Playhouse acknowledges that our theater stands on the traditional land of the Leni Lenape. We honor the land and the indigenous people who inhabited it for thousands of years before European settlers arrived. Welcome to Paper Mill Prologues. We are so excited to be bringing you the third production of our 85th season, After Midnight a show that embraces the artistic explosion of Black excellence and joy represented in the Harlem Renaissance. The goal of prologues is to give our audience an extra layer of insight and context for our productions by exploring some of the themes, histories, and cultural relevance behind each show. What we provide is by no means exhaustive, and we encourage you to continue to explore any topics we raise here on your own. You can also reference our works cited list at the end of the video to dig even deeper. In this video, we'll be taking a closer look at the history behind the Black presence in New York City and why Harlem would prove so influential in the cultivation of Black art. By 1900, Black Americans had been living in Manhattan for nearly 300 years, since 1626, when 11 Africans were brought to the Dutch settlement of New Amsterdam to work under conditions resembling indentured servitude. By the time New Amsterdam had become New York, these indentured servants had become slaves. The majority of Manhattan's early Black population worked on both Dutch and English holdings near the island's southern tip, and they remained in that area until after 1827, when slavery was abolished in New York. In 1830, the census reported that there were now 13,976 Black Americans in Manhattan. Early in the 19th century, this population began leaving the lower section of Manhattan. Moving steadily northward, mostly along the west side, they stayed in neighborhoods for as long as they were able and abandoned them when pressure and or violence from incoming white groups, the expansion of commerce and industry, or their own desire for better housing, forced their migration. By the late 19th century, almost all the Black Americans in Manhattan were displaced into the overpopulated tenements on the west side from the 20s to the 50s in a district known as the Tenderloin. The strip of 7th Avenue in the Tenderloin came to be known as African Broadway. By 1900, the areas of greatest concentration extended as far north as 64th Street, This northern section came to be called San Juan Hill, presumably since many Black veterans of the Spanish-American War lived there. San Juan Hill provided a club culture, as musicians performed in basements for local residents and visitors. One of its most prominent residents, James P. Johnson, was an influential pianist who bridged the eras of ragtime and jazz. He mentored Fats Waller, among others, who often worked the small clubs in the neighborhood as well, and who would, in time, play the venues of Harlem. Thelonious Monk, who moved to San Juan Hill at age five, would eventually become one of the most prolific jazz musicians of his time. The area of the Tenderloin for Black entertainment, known as Black Bohemia, abounded with clubs and saloons. A number of these were owned by leading Black prize fighters, George Dixon's on Sixth Avenue, Joe Walcott's on 31st Street, Joe Gann's Little Egypt on West 33rd Street, and Edmund Johnson's on West 28th, where a 21-year-old UB Blake performed. Baron Wilkins Cafe, which would eventually move to Harlem, was called Little Savoy. Musician Noble Sissel said of it, Baron Wilkins Place up to about 1908 was the most important spot where Negro musicians got acquainted with the wealthy New York clientele who became the first patrons of their music. Baron was one of the greatest benefactors the Negro musician had in New York. He had a great love and respect for talented artists. Barron's became so popular because this wise operator kept his floor an open floor. Anyone who had anything to offer worthwhile could always get up and do a number. It was his fabulous spot that sparked off the renaissance of the Negro musician in New York City. A little north of the Tenderloin, in the 50s, Hotels with restaurants and lounges were springing up. The successful and talented from the worlds of music and theater gathered frequently in the restaurants like that of the Marshall Hotel. 53rd Street, the Evening Telegram said, 
is to the Negro colonies what Fifth Avenue is to white society. The Marshall was where artists gathered to eat, drink, talk, and try out ideas for their work. One of them later recalled that they spent many hours there discussing the manner and means of raising the status of the Negro as a writer, composer, and performer in the New York theater and world of music. This was a transitional moment for black theater, blending some of the less minstrelsy styles of comedy with aspects of the Broadway musical. Though minstrelsy did not totally disappear, as it was necessary to the economics of black performers. White audiences were not ready to accept a sudden break from the black comedy to which they were accustomed. But still, black comedians did begin to impose their own interpretation on the material, shifting it to portray characters and situations that bore a more truthful resemblance to their conduct and culture. The gradual emergence of a post-minstrel style in black comedy coincided with a new development in theater, the arrival of musical comedy reviews that were written, produced, acted, and directed by all black companies. These were among the most popular shows in Manhattan, and the stars of the black musical stage were among the celebrated personalities of New York's theatrical life. Bob Cole and the Johnson Brothers led an all-black ensemble and were widely known as one of the best songwriting teams of the period, and they pushed the movement away from minstrelsy a step farther. They wrote romantic numbers mostly, refuting one of the popular notions of the time, that black artists and performers were unable to reflect on the finer sentiments. Some of their compositions enjoyed popularity beyond the world of black theater. Their work became popular hits on Broadway, where they were sung by such stars as May Irwin, Lillian Russell, Anna Held, Faye Templeton, and Marie Cahill. Under the Bamboo Tree was one of the best known tunes of the early years of the century. Prominent performing duo Williams and Walker produced and acted in their own musical reviews, and New Yorkers of all races flocked to their shows, making them the most acclaimed black comic actors of the day. In Dahomey, which opened at the New York Theater in February of 1903, was one of the first black comedy reviews to appear on Broadway. The show introduced Williams and Walker to the largest audience that the two had yet entertained. In 1921, the all-black blockbuster musical Shuffle Along was a milestone for black theater on Broadway. As one of the earliest hit musicals produced, written, and performed entirely by black Americans, the show proved that black musical productions could be marketed as legitimate successes rather than novelties. Although submitting to certain elements of minstrelsy and stereotype, what Shuffle Along managed to do during its time was knock down barriers in black art because it was created on black artists' own terms. It was a cultural breakthrough, as the first show on Broadway to feature a score of jazz music, as well as presenting a serious romantic subplot between two black actors. Langston Hughes wrote, The 1920s were the years of Manhattan's black renaissance. It began with Shuffle Along, a honey of a show, swift, bright, funny, rollicking, and gay, with a dozen danceable, singable tunes. Everybody was in the audience, including me. People came back to see it innumerable times. It was always packed. It gave just the proper push, a pre-Charleston kick, to that Negro vogue of the 20s that spread to books, African sculpture, music, and dancing. The show became such a phenomenon that it permanently changed traffic patterns to accommodate the large crowds, had midnight showings to satisfy demand, and had audiences of all communities come to bear witness, including George Gershwin, Irving Berlin, Al Jolson, Fanny Bryce, and Fiorello LaGuardia. Shuffle Along had ushered in a new era of cultural prosperity and influence for Black New York. In addition to its entirely Black cast and creative team, the orchestra featured many Puerto Rican musicians, blending cultural sounds to be heard by the masses. It launched the careers of many actors, musicians, and creatives, including Josephine Baker, Paul Robeson, Adelaide Hall, and William Grant Still. Co-creator Noble Sissel said, My partner, Yubi Blake, and I want to be evangelists. We want to do something for the Negro race to which we belong. And if we compel white audiences to listen to us, if we entertain them, and if out of 10,000 persons who see and hear us, 100 think a little better of the colored man than in the past, then we have done something that's better than salary. In fact, 
That's what we want to do. It is our biggest aim. Unfortunately, Shuffle Along's influence and importance was lost to history until recently. However, we now celebrate its undeniable contributions to theater and society as a whole. While some Black artists were achieving success, around this time, the average Black worker earned around $7 a week, and a small four-room apartment in Black Bohemia cost $5 a week to rent. And though Black tenants tended to occupy the worst houses in the Tenderloin and San Juan Hill districts, they paid up to $5 more than white tenants did for the same type of lodging. Harper's Weekly printed the following. Property is not rented to Negroes in New York until white people will no longer have it. Then rents are put up from 30 to 50 percent, and Negroes are permitted to take a street or sometimes a neighborhood. There are really not many Negro sections, and all that exist are fearfully crowded. The time had come to continue the migration north, to Harlem. Harlem earned its reputation of well-paved streets and grand brownstones in the 1880s, when developers envisioned it as an upper-class white haven far from cramped and noisy downtown Manhattan. In 1880, the elevated rail line was built along the west side of Harlem, and with the subway scheduled to be built on the east side, there was a sudden boom in real estate, and developers overbuilt the neighborhood before the subway arrived. Whole apartment buildings remained unoccupied while they waited for white tenants. At the same time, the Tenderloin was well over capacity, and a fledgling realtor, Philip A. Payton Jr., recognized the desperation the white landlords in Harlem were experiencing. He knew middle-class Black Americans would pay anything to get out of the overcrowding in Manhattan, and he offered landlords a decent rental rate. Payton was given properties to manage, and Black tenants, looking for better accommodations, flocked to Harlem and filled them as fast as they were available. This enabled the landlords to dispose of their property or to get a stronger return from rents, which, even in Harlem, were still higher for Black tenants. As Black Americans moved into Harlem, most white Harlemites responded to this by abandoning the neighborhood, while others organized the Hudson Realty Company with the mission to purchase buildings that housed the newcomers and evict them. Outraged Blacks fought this white resistance, and Peyton organized the Afro-American Realty Company, the largest enterprise of its kind that had ever been Black-owned and Black-run in New York, and they bought up housing to rent to Black tenants with the aim that it should be possible for a Black American to live anywhere he desires if he has the money to pay the rent. From the beginning of the century, Black populations had traveled from the South to the North, known as the Great Migration, by the 1920s, some 300,000 Black Americans had moved north, and Harlem was one of the most popular destinations for these families. Real estate in Harlem began to skyrocket as a result. Estimates at the time placed the total Black American ownership in Harlem at $200 million. Harlem had become a welcoming and livable community for Black Americans, and they were there to stay. However, still paying higher than average rents, Harlemites found creative avenues to support their neighbors. Rent parties were social gatherings in working-class African-American neighborhoods, most notably in Harlem, created as a solution for the growing housing crisis. Always, I used to dance at house rent parties. Uh-huh. See, the house Did rent your parties, mother have mother house did, rent parties? To pay the rent. So yes. if you will explain I house rent in, parties to the young who will be looking at this, what well, was a house rent house party? House rent party is a person, you know, on Saturday night you have a party, you serve pig feet, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, bad whiskey, and everything is 25 cents. 25 cents to come in, 25 cents. And then at a certain time when the, the piano player would be playing everything, get up, it's time to dance. And I dance on cue, I get ice cream. Oh, that was the incentive. <laughs> to keep the attendance of these parties at capacity, as well as to avoid the attention of police, the host would run invitations around town with catchy subliminal rhymes and jingles written on them about the upcoming event. The usual guests of these parties were working-class citizens who would be looking for a chance to unwind and socialize after the work week. Those of the upper-class, Harlem elite, would also find themselves at these parties to partake in the wild and rowdy activities, including frequent party guest Langston Hughes. 
Rent parties served as a place for musicians to hone their skills and partake in competitions with each other, known as cutting contests. Various derivatives of jazz developed, specifically stride piano music. Musicians who participated in these parties included Fats Waller, Yubi Blake, Willie the Lion Smith, and Duke Ellington. Various swing dance styles originated at these parties. With an impromptu and competitive nature, dancers would implement as many popular dances into their performance as possible to show off their talents, resulting in a blending and augmenting of styles. This led to the invention of even more new and original dance styles, some of those including the Lindy Hop, the Charleston, the Black Bottom, the Shimmy, Truckin', the Break, and snake hips. As the contributions of black artists grew more visible, the rent party culture shifted into the growing popularity of nightclubs. White patrons would come to Harlem nightclubs to drink, dance, and listen to jazz and blues music. The Savoy Ballroom, one of the very few nightclubs where there was no racial barrier amongst attendees, was also known as the home of happy feet, and the Lindy was the dance style of choice. Swing has a marvelous thing of bringing people together. Oh, uh, you know it. Uh, brought, you know, brought she and I together. <laughs> we we had white dancers in the Savoy Ballroom. Oh yeah, Lindy. And I'm telling you, they were good. Oh man, were they ever? They were so good that you wanted to hit them. <laughs> But see, that was such a, an American thing. We had Italian boys that used to come from the Bronx. You had the Jewish boys that come from Brooklyn. And this melting pot of everybody trying to outdance each other. We didn't know how rich we were in relationships. But 50 years ago, when we look back, we realized we had a wonderful thing going with all races. And that's what made the Savoy so such a ex wonderful place to be, right? By the 1930s, Lindy Hop entered mainstream popular culture and became an international sensation. The Cotton Club, arguably the hottest nightclub in New York City, was in business from 1923 to 1940. Based in Harlem, and then in the Midtown Theater District, the Cotton Club was known for its exciting, electrifying song and dance acts, where Black performers would entertain the club's all-white audience. The Cotton Club featured a roster of legendary names and helped springboard the careers of many performers. Ethel Waters, Bill Bojangles Robinson, Lena Horne, Nicholas Brothers, Catherine Dunham. Outside of the nightlife, dance pioneers such as Catherine Dunham, Edna Guy, and Hemsley Winfield broke barriers to expand the array of styles black dance could excel in beyond jazz and tap. Their efforts set the precedent on how African diasporic dance could be integrated into the concert dance setting. On Broadway, choreographers such as Buddy Bradley and Billy Pierce were essential in teaching black vernacular dance to Broadway stars and ghost choreographing shows. And let me tell you, rhythm is our business. In music, jazz and blues reigned supreme through the 20s and 30s, launching the careers of Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, and Louis Armstrong. At the same time, the worlds of Broadway and jazz began to intersect with further implementation of jazz scores in Broadway musicals. These musicals and reviews were pivotal in increasing the visibility of black musicians and the hit show tunes that would eventually become classic jazz standards. The increase in social opportunity in select nightclubs, speakeasies, rent parties, and drag balls provided the space for queer subculture and art to flourish and served as a major milestone in LGBTQ history. Popular gatherings, such as Alelia Walker's private parties at Villa Luaro and the Dark Tower, served as havens where artists were encouraged to mix and mingle as their full, authentic selves. From writers such as County Cullen and Richard Bruce Nugent, to entertainers such as Bessie Smith 
Jimmy Daniels, and Gladys Bentley, this era in Harlem saw many Black, queer artists become major contributors to the greater cultural renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was a major component of an even larger movement, known as the New Negro Movement, that occurred in other major hubs across the country, including Chicago, Cleveland, Los Angeles, and DC. The artistic and political movement was a response by the Black community to combat the widely accepted notion that only certain groups of people are capable of extraordinary genius. Through music, visual art, dance, and literature, these artistic outlets were used as positive propaganda that asserted political and civil rights for Black people. Black artistic expression during this time, while giving artists a chance to find their true, authentic voices, opened doors to economic opportunity and social acceptance. Harlem was an incubator of Black excellence, and its renaissance shows us that with the space and freedom to exist, and with the opportunity to challenge and collaborate, artists will discover their full potential. Its legacy must remind us what we as a society have lost when cultures have been silenced and what we have gained from the perseverance and determination of black excellence. So join us as we continue the legacy and bring the vibrance, magnetism, and exhilaration of the Harlem Renaissance to our stage. Check your clocks. It's almost after midnight. Enjoy the show. <laughs>